normal to rewrite an entire book so many times. Why aren't you self-publishing? The next book I'm going to be working on. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. Hello everyone and welcome to another video. I finished my novel. As you guys would know if you watched the previous vlog, Project Teacup is officially finally done. It is now submitted to agents after like three years of work, you know, like a year and a half of like proper deep work and three years after coming up with the idea and the book is done. It's completely done and I thought it would be a fun idea to go out to everyone on Instagram and ask if they had any questions specifically about Project Teacup and you guys had a lot of questions. This is the most questions I've ever gotten for a Q&A. There were 300 questions and I did my best to pick the questions that seemed to come up the most. The very first question is, when did you know the idea you had was one worth developing into a project? I went on a bit of an excavation process with this book after I finished my very first novel, which I submitted to agents back in 2020, which got en masse rejected by everyone. After that happened, I knew I wanted to jump into a project pretty quickly. I had a few ideas I was kicking around with. It sort of took the confluence of a few different things coming together. It was the mix of me going into a cafe at the end of 2019 while I was still working for the arts festival. We were in a co-working space. We had a planning day for the coming festival. And in that co-working space, there was a cafe and the barista who served me, I was like, oh my god, you're a character in a novel. One of the characters came from that experience. I knew immediately that that person was going to be the inspiration for something. I think I was walking to work when I worked in tech. I was listening to Ghost Empire by Richard Feidler. That was another big chunk of inspiration. It took me like a year and a half of trying to start this novel and trying to find an angle in. I had a vague idea of what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't have all the pieces yet. It wasn't until until basically I had finished a year in Tokyo, my second book that I created, but first book that I've released into the world, which is of course my non-fiction illustrated guide and memoir that is available on my website if you're interested. It took until basically that was done that I had the headspace to collect the final pieces and to begin that story. I could not begin the story until I had the title, the ending, and the blurb. Those were the three things I absolutely needed in order to start because the thing that I went wrong with in the first novel was that I didn't have a compelling blurb, I didn't have a title after so many years of working on that first novel I freaked out and couldn't find a title that encapsulated it and so I knew that I needed the ending, the blurb and the title in order to move forward with the next one and I'm not going to start another book until I have those three things otherwise I will panic. <laughs> I'm realizing now that I just answered like three questions in one, a bunch of these questions are about inspiration and like where you got the idea, how much the idea did you have before you got to the first draft? Was there one specific moment that sparked your imagination for Project Teacup? So as I said, that time in the coffee shop, reading Ghost Empire, I recently looked back on earlier drafts of the story and it did not have nearly the level of stuff in it that it has now. Like I had the very small building blocks of the story when I got started. It was was the work of iteration, it was through trial and error, it was the books I read along the way, along those three years from when I came up with the very first part of the idea. I changed quite a bit of the ending, the characterization of one of the main characters changed significantly, one of the side characters, their characterization changed massively between the first draft and the third draft, names of significant characters changed. When I go through and I do the drafting process there are really big changes happening the whole way through, that's the excavation process of finding the story because it doesn't come to me fully fleshed out. Sometimes it does with short stories but with this novel it did not happen. <laughs> what is your favorite memory of writing this book? I mean I've loved so many parts of writing this story. I really loved having Tyler, my partner, read it. That was a really fulfilling moment for me to see his reactions to the things that I had written. When we were on the Trover trip that we went on back in May, I read the blurb of the story to a couple of the travelers and seeing their reaction, seeing their excitement got me so excited about the story. That was a really like happy moment for me. I think my favorite moment of actually writing though was right after I quit my job like working in tech and I hadn't finished a year in Tokyo yet but I took myself out to a cafe and I sat down and I did some writing stuff and it was like a Tuesday afternoon. It was the first day I had of being a self-employed person and sitting there and, and writing and I felt incredibly free even though writing is not my full-time job in any way. That was a really really happy moment for 
for me because I'd, I'd, I'd worked so hard to become self-employed and having that time and space to write on a Tuesday afternoon was really significant. What is the part you hated the most? Oh my God, it, there's so many parts that are so difficult. Having these scenes and having to problem solve these things and, and having to constantly work so hard. Like there's so many different skill sets that you need to improve and you need to work on in order to write a novel and to write a novel well. I think my attitude generally is quite resilient with it. Like generally when it comes to writing stuff, my mindset is if I don't know how to do that thing, I'm gonna sit down and learn. I'm gonna work it out. It will not beat me. I'll do the thing. It will be fine. It will be difficult, but I'll get through it. And so in terms of like not feeling good enough to write the story, not feeling like I have the skill set, it's like just sit down and work it out. You'll, you'll get it done. I think the hardest part slash the part I didn't like the most was trying to juggle all of my other work because there would be weeks at a time where I had so much content work that I had to put Project Teacup on pause and it would eat away at me. Like I felt so sad and uncomfortable because I couldn't work on that story because I had just so much work to do for my other stuff. And that's just life that happens to lots of people, but that's probably the hardest part, trying to temper my own expectations with how much time I have to write, especially as a self-employed person who has control of her schedule. I can't let writing take up my entire life because I have a job which I need to do. Was it difficult at times to write that much? Coming from writing short stories, it must have been a huge shift. Novels are my first love. I They're a completely different medium to short stories and I like short stories, but they're not where my heart lies. Like I, I will work on short stories. I'll keep trying to get short stories published, but I've been novel writing since I was 16. The first time I tried to write a longish story, I was probably younger than that. Like I have been actively writing long stories for a very, very long time now. And I far prefer it as a medium because you have so much space. I find short stories in many ways a lot trickier than I find writing novels. What was your most regular writing routine? I have gotten so many questions about my writing routine ever since I started making the author writing routine videos. I don't have a writing routine. Like basically if I'm not working, on content stuff, I'm writing. It doesn't matter if it's nine o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night or 3 p.m. on a Saturday. If I wasn't working on my like other job stuff, then I was writing. Like it, for me, it doesn't really matter. It's more about my headspace that week. It's more about how creatively burnt out I am working on other stuff that week. I really like working at the library. I'm happy to work on my desktop. I'm happy to work on my tablet. I will type on my phone if I need to. I don't have a specific routine. Some weeks I'm feeling filming a sit down talking video and it's only going to take a couple hours to do, then I'll go do the editing. Sometimes I'm filming a reading vlog that will take four days to film and then I won't have time to write on those days. So it's, it's honestly all over the place. And in addition to asking about my routine, questions on how many days did I write? How many hours did I spend? So it honestly varied week to week, day to day. My usual writing session would probably be around four hours, I would say. I think I would really struggle with anything less than two hours. Hours. However, for Project Teacup, generally I worked between four hours in a day to eight hours, wherever I could fit it in between my other work. Before we jump into the next question, I just wanted to thank the lovely sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is a website builder which enables people to create captivating websites. I've had my website for almost three years now and I love Squarespace as a platform. It's incredibly easy to use, it is a dream to maintain, and it is so little effort to update which, if you're a busy creative person, is exactly what you want in a website platform. Squarespace uses Fluid Engine which is a next generation website design system that makes it incredibly easy for users to unlock their creativity. Squarespace's templates are best in class and you can customize every design detail with drag and drop technology. If you're looking to make a website, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Christy Ann Jones to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. How do you prevent getting bored doing so many drafts? I think you have to be really in love with the craft of writing. Boredom was never the problem. I've, I've never once been bored working on the drafts. I've gotten tired before, but for whatever reason, I enjoy writing enough that I'm never going to get bored doing it. Did you have an alternate project going for when you couldn't mentally work on Project Teacup? Not really, because my job and all my other work is already so creative that it's really hard for me to juggle. I mean, in January, 
January of this year, I wrote uh, Narcissus's Shroud. It's so different. I chose that title and still I struggle to pronounce it. Narcissus's Shroud, which is a short story I'm still trying to get published. That's just, that's just publishing. I wrote that short story. Aside from that, not really. I've just been really focused on Project Teacup and really wanting to get it done. When working at your novel, were there times where you felt like giving up? And Gavin asked, do you remember a specific day where you almost gave up, but you persevered? Not really, no. Like, I think I'm so committed to this idea of being a novelist that it just wasn't really in my cognition at all to give up on the story. By the time I buckled down and I really decided that this was the novel I wanted to write during this period of my life, I was already set on finishing it. But no, I never considered giving up on it. Even when it was difficult, I still just had that mentality of, yeah, it's difficult, but I'm gonna push myself and get through it anyway. Is the story plot driven or character driven? I would have said both, but Tyler said it was character driven, so I'll trust his judgment on that. It's probably more character driven than plot driven. Believable dialogue is my biggest weakness. Do you have any advice? Oh, dialogue is so difficult. It's so, so challenging. I think the, the dialogue I got the story up to on the fourth draft is the only draft where I've even been mildly happy with the dialogue. I think with dialogue, you need to pay a lot of attention to subtext. I think you need to read the dialogue aloud to make sure it sounds like the kind of thing that someone would say out loud. I think you also need to be really careful not to lean into cliche. The dialogue that I had in the first and second draft was was pretty bad. Um, and I found that basically my edits of that dialogue was mostly me cutting stuff out because I'd over explained it. So brevity, compression are all really important, I think, to strong dialogue. How was your process to create your characters? It was trial and error. It took a long time. There are two main characters in the story, but the character who I had a little bit more trouble with, they're a completely different person in the second draft. It took me so many drafts to work out who these people were. And so much of it was me just finding and feeling my way and using my intuition and working it out as I went. How do you find your theme? Okay, so this is a twofold answer. I need to have a theme before I start the story. I need to know roughly what that story is going to be about. I had the first part of the theme before I started because the theme is intrinsic to the two main characters and their relationship with each other. However, there were more themes that sort of unearthed themselves as I was writing. So I need the main theme before I start and that theme is the thing that I really care about, that I really want to say about the world. And I think that's the, the main thing that's really pushing me forward to write the story. Is it normal to rewrite an entire book so many times? I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think it is. My, if you, if you're not familiar with the process that I used to write this story, I wrote the first draft and then I basically, I took that and put it in a folder and I did not reread it. From my memory of that draft, I replotted out the story and then I wrote it again. And then with the second draft, I took that and I rewrote the story entirely again. And then with the next draft, the fourth draft, I rewrote the story entirely again. This was, for whatever reason, the best way I found to write this story. Of course, I'm not an expert in novel writing. I'm still learning my craft. I'm still learning how to write stories. And I found that rewriting from scratch each time was the best way that I could get the compression that I needed, that I could really flesh out the characters of the story. I don't know if my process for the next story is going to be like this, but this is just what I had to do for this story. I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote it and I'm so glad I did because that's the only way I got the story to the spot where it's now sitting at and I'm pretty happy with it. How long did you wait between writing each draft? I <laughs> just like went overseas so like the uh I think the first draft I wrote like pretty quickly in 2022 what year is it yep 2022 I think I waited like a couple weeks or maybe three weeks. Second draft I wrote and finished, then we went to Japan at the end of last year, then I wrote the third draft, and then we went to Japan again, and now I'm sitting here having finished the fourth draft. So basically each time I took a break from the story it was like somewhere between two and four weeks of waiting in between just to refresh my brain and to look at it with fresh eyes. Why was word count so important to you? Sorry if you've already said, I'm curious. I have explained this a bit but I do keep getting this question, so I'm going to go over it again. Word count is really important to your genre. If you're writing epic fantasy, then yes, you can have a story that's 150,000 words. And that's what the genre expects and that's what publishers expect. If you want your book to be traditionally published, it's really important that you try to stick to the 
rules of publishing, or at least that's my understanding like from all the research I've done. Generally for commercial fantasy, you want to be around the 100,000 word mark, anything longer than 120,000 words, and it becomes more difficult to sell to publishers. Anything under like 90,000 words, and it's the same kind of thing. There are certain expectations based on how many words there are supposed to be in a story. And because my story is commercial fantasy, that's where it sat. In addition to that, word count is also a really easy thing for me to use to track my progress. It's an easy thing for me to talk to you guys about in writing vlogs because I can't share spoilers from the book. I can't share character names. I cannot share the title. I cannot share any of this stuff because it is all subject to change. It is all subject to an editor saying, hey, let's make that different, right? So I can't share any of those specific things because they could all change. I also use the word count to help me visualize my pacing of the story. It's just that for me, for whatever reason, the way my brain works, I'm very structurally minded. And so words mean a lot to me. They don't mean a lot to some other writers. Like it's everyone writes in their own specific way, but that's basically why I talk about word count a lot. Marina asked, what is the hardest bit of editing? Maybe like the stamina of getting through it, like having to sit there day after after day and make sure that you're still bringing your best brain to the desk to, to be able to problem solve everything. You know, there are some days you're going to be more tired than others and some days you're not going to be able to fix problems as perfectly. Like with a story like this, with an intricate plot, with mystery elements, with so many characters, with character arcs, slightly complex magic system, there were so many things going on in this story. And so if I changed one thing, it would have a domino effect on so many other things. And there were there were big restructures I did in this story. And trying to mentally juggle so many little pieces every day while I was writing was quite challenging. However, I love that process. I, I It is my favorite kind of problem solving. If you could have any author to blurb your book, who would you choose and why? Generally, let's, oh, Spinning Silver has quotes from Catherine Arden, R.M. Carey, Zen Cho. You want to reach out to authors who are similar to you to make readers read that story. I would love it to be Neil Gaiman. Like that, that would, that would, oh my God, that would make my life not realistic at all. However, I would choose Neil Gaiman because he's my favorite author. Probably more strategically, my comp titles to this book are probably Babel by R.F. Kuang and Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell by Susanna Clarke because my story is a historically inspired setting and it's a fantasy novel. R.F. Kuang and Susanna Clarke would be my ideal, my ideal people to have because those are my comp titles. Um, yeah. Shoot for the stars. <laughs> did you create the query slash pitch for agents before you finished the draft? Yes, I did. I had written my query letter before I finished the fourth draft. I had my blurb for the story before I started writing the first draft. As I said, with my first novel, the big thing that fell down for that is that it wasn't a marketable idea. I didn't have a really strong way to describe it. There was no elevator pitch none of that. Like it just didn't stand up on paper. And so with this story, it was really important to me that it would stand up on paper. So yes, I had my blurb already written. So I had that the whole time, which made up a bulk of the query. And then I wrote my query letter maybe like two months ago, cause I was bored one afternoon and I was like, let's just write the query letter. What were all the docs you needed to send to publishers? So the way this works, if you're not familiar with how traditional publishing tends to work is that if you're an aspiring author, you finish your novel. You have to make sure your novel is entirely done before you do this process, otherwise it's very cheeky. You send it to an agent. You try to get an agent out of however many people you send it to. Once you've gotten yourself an agent, that agent will then send the book to editors of various publishing houses. So I haven't sent my book to any publishers yet. I've sent my book to agents. And the material you need to send to agents differs depending on which agent you're sending to and what they ask for. So most of the time they're going to ask for some sample chapters of the book. So for me that was is normally the first three chapters of the book. They ask for a query letter, which is like a one page letter to the agent. And often they also ask for a short summary. And so for me, that was a one page summary. Basically is you describing the entire plot of the story, including spoilers. Some agents wanted the entire book and no summary. Some agents don't want any sample pages. They just want 
your cover letter and your summary. I'm not in Australia, so I wonder how to find slash reach for publishers. Do you send your manuscript out to agents who are local to you or domestically? Here's the funny thing about Australia and Australian publishing and agents in Australia. There aren't any Australian agents who represent fantasy, so I don't have a choice. I have to go internationally. It's possible that maybe there are there's one and I just haven't found them, but essentially the Australian literary scene is very insular. It's very, very focused on itself. And if you're a speculative writer, if you're a genre writer, there is not the support in Australia for you, which is quite frustrating for me and for, I suppose, a lot of different countries around the world who are like English speaking countries looking to publish books. We all have to submit to agents in the UK and in the US. The process of doing that was me basically just googling people and trying to find the agents who I think would best enjoy my work. It's very time consuming and it, it's, it's a pain but you have to do it. It's a part of the process. Will you self-publish it? Why aren't you self-publishing? I have been hounded with questions ever since I started making my Project Teacup vlogs and I kind of get it because there's such a niche on YouTube for author tube content and most of those authors seem to be self-published authors and so I think that if you're flicking between my channel and the channels of many different author tube people who are all self-published it might seem a bit funny that I'm just being like nah nah I'm not gonna self-publish this book. The thing is that I have self-published a book. I self-published a year in Tokyo. This bad boy, this is the one I self-published. I went through a service called Ingram Spark. They are a printer and distributor. They handle basically everything. The big benefits of self-publishing generally are that you make a lot more profit per book sold. If you're printing a black and white book, this book you may notice not black and white, entirely in color, which means that the overheads are really, really high, which means that you do not make a big profit. In fact, you make a very, very, very small one. Generally, if you're printing a regular novel, the big benefit is that you can make a lot more money. However, there are a lot of drawbacks to self-publishing and those drawbacks are the main reasons why I'm not going down that route with my novel. I'm not saying no, I don't wanna do it ever. I would consider it at a certain point, but given the current landscape of publishing, traditional publishing and self-publishing. It's not something I want to do just at the moment. And I've learned this firsthand myself with self-publishing a year in Tokyo. It is really, really difficult to get a self-published book in front of people who don't already know who you are. It's really tough to get self-published books into libraries, which is a really important thing to me. I was basically raised by the South Australian public library. Like I love libraries. It's really hard to get your book into bookstores unless you've called them, emailed, them, hounded them. I, I tried to get this book into my local Dimmix and I couldn't do it because it was too difficult because bookstores require a 40% cut of the book sale and it, and it basically meant that I would be earning like 10 cents a copy on these books and then you had to factor in my time to go and deliver them and it, it's all a pain. All of the physical copies I've sold of these books in bookstores have basically not made any money. I think they've lost money given the petrol it's taken me to drive to places. Again, I have no regrets. I'm really happy that my book was in a book store. It was up at Matilda Bookshop in Sterling. It's basically impossible to get your book translated into foreign languages unless you organize it yourself. It's just really difficult all around. And the thing is that to be quite frank, if I wanted to be a YouTuber, who sells books to her audiences and who wants to just make a bunch of money from doing that, I would self-publish this book. However, I want to be an author. One day my goal would be to have my readership of my novels not necessarily be the same people who are subscribed to my YouTube channel. I want to be able to produce books that stand on their own, that, that people want to review and read because they've stumbled onto them in a bookshop and they have no idea who I am, right? I want my writing to be able to stand on its own two feet. Feet. And so that's why I'm going down the traditional publishing route. I do think it's really interesting what's happening in the self-publishing realm. I think Brandon Sanderson has done an amazing job. I think that he is a really interesting business case for self-publishing from a bigger, more popular author. If it is four years from now and Project Teacup still hasn't found a home and I've written three more novels and none of them have found homes, I'll probably change my mind on this. But for now, I want to try the traditional publishing route and just see how that goes. Moving 
moving along to the questions about the next book I'm going to be working on. Do you already have ideas for your next story? Is there anything different you plan to do with your next project? Do you already have another story in mind for the next project? Yes, I do. I already have the next three stories that I want to work on mapped out in my brain. I came up with the bare bones of the next novel maybe like a year and a half ago. I come up with the ideas for these stories really really far in advance so I've been sitting on the next three novels I want to work on for years. I had these ideas when I was fleshing out Project I had some of these ideas when I was fleshing out the early stages of Project Teacup. I haven't found the title or the blurb of the story yet, so I need to develop that before I can get to work on it. I'm hoping to start work on it before the end of this year. Essentially for me, I just want to jump straight into the next thing once I've had a bit of a break. I have a couple of short stories I want to work on just to sort of cleanse my brain and then I'm going to start on the next novel. Trying to work out which ideas are their own novel and which ideas fit together is a really challenging thing so I need to go on a bit of a journey for discovering that. I know the, what the next story is going to be, the story after that I want to be a series, like a really big epic series. I have a lot of ideas for that series but I want to get another standalone done first before I do that. I think those were all of the questions. This is probably a very very long Q&A but thank you very much for your support. Like I can't put into words how kind and how generous and how lovely all of you have been with all of your comments on the videos, with your comments on Instagram, your excitement for Project Teacup. Like it's so heartwarming because writing can be a very isolating thing. It can be very lonely and there are really long timelines when it comes to writing. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. I'm really thankful to all of you for being here and for watching these videos. Before I go, I did also want to say a massive thank you to everyone over on Patreon for supporting my channel over on Patreon. We have a whole bunch of bonus content, bonus videos where I talk about writing craft and a whole bunch of other stuff. Writing snippets, some sneaky snippets that have been put up there recently. We have our private Discord server, our book club. There's a whole bunch of stuff over on Patreon. So if you want to support my work or if you want bonus content from me, please feel free to go and check out Patreon. Uh, take care everyone and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.